Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Tom Solomon. I'm a clinical academic. I'm the director of the Pandemic Institute in Liverpool, and I'm also Vice President International of the Academy of Medical Sciences. Uh, I want to welcome you all to tonight's event, which is the Academy of Medical Sciences and the Lancet International Health Lecture. Uh, just a little bit about the Academy of Medical Sciences for those who are not familiar with it. It's the UK's National Academy for Medical Science. Our mission is to promote medical science and its translation into benefits for society. And the International Health Lecture provides a platform for leaders in global health to discuss topics of international significance and promote discussion. It was established in 2004 and this is now the seventh year uh, so that we've done it in partnership with the Lancet, so we're grateful for their support. Um, the lecture previously has been an in-person event. Of course, that couldn't happen for the last two years, and so it was a, a Zoom event. And uh, this year, for the first time, we've gone for the best of both worlds. So this is a hybrid event. And we'd say, I'd say we've got about 100 people in the room here, for those who are online, and we have more than 900 registered online. And I'd like to give a, a special welcome to the onliners. I guess that's the camera up there. Yes, there we are. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. And um, we, we do want to hear from people. There'll be the chance for discussion later on. But to check the online functions are working, I'd like uh, all 936 people online to just type into the question box where they are listening from. And that will, one, let us know the Q&A function's working, two, uh, it will give us a feeling for, for, for where all the listeners are from, but I understand they're from all around the world. Um, so, uh, I'd like to remind the audience here to switch their mobile phones off. And uh, for those who do uh, Twittering, tweeting, that kind of thing, I know many of you are very good on the social media. The hashtag for tonight's event is IHL2022. So, in a minute, I'm going to hand over to Richard Horton, uh, who will introduce tonight's speaker. Um, after... Uh, tonight's speaker, Victor Zhao, has, has given his lecture. We're going to have some preliminary panel remarks from Adima, Karam Zaman, Ian Buchan, and Raki Dandona, who is herself online. And then there'll be about 40 minutes for questions and answers. So do please, if you're in the audience here, write down your questions as they go along. And if you're in the online audience, then you can type your questions uh, as we go along, and then we'll come to them at the end. Okay. Well, that's everything from me, so I'd now like to invite Richard Horton, who has been the editor of The Lancet since an extraordinary 1993. Richard, just in case you needed reminding, welcome. Thank you very much, Thank you very much Tom. Um, this, is, this is the absolute highlight of the year um, for us um, to be in partnership with the Academy of Medical Sciences, which is the most extraordinary organization. Um, it's relatively young in terms of National Academies of Science, certainly far younger than the Royal Society, for example. But if you measure its impact uh, in terms of the fellowship, in terms of the reports that it's published, and the impact those reports have had on policy, um, then I think you would agree with me that the Academy punches well above its weight. And it's great to see Professor Ann Johnson, the president here in the audience, supporting us this evening. Um, it's also a particular pleasure to be here with you this evening because Victor Zhao is a great friend um, and somebody I have admired over many decades. Um, Victor, as you know, is the president of the United States National Academy of Medicine, their preeminent National Academy of Sciences. Uh, you may well have heard it referred to in the past as the Institute of Medicine. He's also the vice chair of the National Research Council. He's the James B. Duke Professor of Medicine and Chancellor Emeritus at Duke University and a past president and chief executive of the Duke University Health System, which is where I really engaged and began to admire the far ranging breadth um, and really quite admirable brilliance of Victor's thinking. He is globally recognized and indeed decorated as 
not only a scientist, but also an administrator and a leader in his field. His work began uh, with the renin angiotensin system um, and its contribution to cardiovascular disease. And that early work provided part of the foundation for the development of what remain today a very powerful and important class of life-saving drugs. But it's really in his role as a leader in medicine that Professor Zhao has produced significant results for health innovation. His vision as an academic medical leader at Duke and elsewhere has really led to the, a transformation in the way we think about the contribution of academic centers, not just in terms of translation, but as global, truly global institutions. In 2010, over a decade now ago, he advanced the concept of the discovery to care continuum, um, which has been widely accepted and adopted as a model for academic medicine, not only in the United States, but world wide. To take that idea a step further, he developed the concept of the Duke Translational Medicine Institute, innovation taking to practice, and Duke Global Health Institute as well, one of the foremost global health institutes in the world, together with the Duke Institute for Health Innovation and the Duke National University collaboration with, in Singapore. But it's particularly important that I recognize Victor's contribution as president as, of the National Academy of Medicine. It's not easy being a president of a, of a national academy. Um, your members want you to be incisive, decisive, and politically engaged. And yet, when you're the president of a national academy, it's very hard to be any of those things. You're in a very delicate position. Uh, and when Victor came in as president of the National Academy of Medicine, you may remember there was a past president of the United States who might have made his life rather uncomfortable, um, not known as he was for being particularly pro-science. Uh, that would have flummoxed most presidents of a National Academy. But Victor doubled down and created a voice for the Academy which was challenging, holding the US government accountable at a moment of really quite existential crisis for a nation during the pandemic. And so I would like to pay a particular personal tribute for your leadership over recent years, which has really maintained and I would say strengthened the reputation of American science in the world at a critical moment in world history. Tonight, Victor is going to speak on another controversial topic. Has traditional academic medicine had its day? It's a simple yes or no answer, and we're going to find out tonight. Please welcome Victor Zhao. Richard, I know you're extremely eloquent, but I think you went over the top in my introduction. <laughs> Damian Johnson, thank you for inviting me, and Richard and Tom Solomon. You know, it's a great honor for me to give this lecture when they called me, I said, of course, because it comes from true, your word, extraordinary institutions, the Lancet and the Academy of Medical Sciences in UK, phenomenal organization, and the leaders who I have great respect for, and Johnson, Richard, and of course, Tom Solomon, and my good friend, so actually, I remember it was at a consortium of university global health meeting when I spoke, when Richard stood up in front of a thousand people and said, Victor, what are you doing about this thing, about Trump and all this stuff? I remember that, right? And I said, oh my God, <laughs> I know I've got my charge, I've got to better do a better job, and so here we are. I, I would say that this is a very unique time for us because my wife, Ruth, who's here with me today, we came on Sunday because, you know, we planned this some time ago, but we came very historic moment. And I thought it was really wonderful to witness and really being touched by 
the respect and love of the people, not only here, but United States, of uh, the late uh, Her Majesty the Queen Elizabeth II, and the transition support of the new monarch, King Charles III. So we're so glad that this is all, you know, happened in a seamless fashion. And I know that if you watch American television, like CNN, 50% of the time is in fact on this whole event. So how important it is to America as well. As you all know, we are good friends. You may say, has he gone over the cliff? Why did he choose this topic? But first I have a disclosure, a disclaimer. It's actually Tom and Richard who assigned this topic. And I wrote back and I said, you sure you want me to talk about this? Maybe I'll talk about something else. Then after a lot of thinking and debate, I said, okay, maybe I'll give it a try. And I can pivot to something I've been writing about, which is where academic medicine should go. Because after all, traditional medicine is rooted in the way we teach our students. We do our research and I do clinical care. So maybe not so bad, but if you don't like what I said, you can blame it on two of them. So let me begin by saying, this is really important for me to say this, how much I appreciate the hardworking, dedicated doctors, nurses, and healthcare workers who are practicing medicine today. Had it not for them, we all know that many people would have died with COVID and their dedication has been phenomenal. And myself, having been trained in traditional medicine at McGill University, because I really understand why the need to focus and the teaching, certainly during my time and even now on focusing on patients with illness. Nevertheless, I think the topic today simply says, maybe it's not quite enough. And maybe we should look at how things are going with medicine, with health and healthcare as a whole. So that's the topic of my talk. And so I begin by sharing this slide by saying, okay, what is traditional medicine? I think all of us think about Hippocrates as kind of the person who pointed out how important it is to look at human suffering, caring for the sick, elevating pain and suffering. And almost, I'd say in all US medical schools and probably here as well, we take the Hippocratic Oath. And that's a ritual that every student goes through. And we remember, do no harm, we relieve suffering and uh, cure the sick. So the ethos of that medicine is shown here has always been the art of healing of those who are sick. And we can certainly trace our Western education back to the 12th century uh, of University of Bologna, as you probably know, and how it's evolved over time. But I think it's really interesting to look at the practice of medicine here I've shown you a few of a collage of some paintings. Luke Fields, the paintings at Tate, is done in 1891 of a physician at the bedside of a patient. Or William Osler, so William Osler up here in the 1800s, late 1800s, early 1900s, at bedside, bench to bedside. And of course, we know that that's in fact the beginning of the way we look at both, you know, what we call a country doctor, a home visit, to the evolution of in fact teaching in the hospital, to of course, in the last 20th century, tremendous advances in medicine, whereby medical specialties are being formed. And so now here we are today, you know, systems full of specialized medicine a general practice, or we call primary care, providing a general care, and that's the system we have today. And this picture shows the diversity of NHS physicians, where we all talk about patient-centric care, how to make sure that we're looking at what's needed by the patient. Now, this ethos has carried us well, as shown in this slide, which in fact emphasizes that across the world, people work endless hours to treat patients with illness, and certainly during COVID, has been extraordinarily important, the work that's done by the traditional medicine, by the physicians, nurses, and others. So what, in fact, how would you define traditional medicine? I would say, perhaps, with a little trepidation, I'll put it this way. 
it's focused on diagnosis, treatment, and management of individual patients. And that's really important. If you're a patient, you want that focus if you have an illness. And therefore, the research has always been around physiology, pathophysiology, more recently, molecular cellular biology, a mechanism of disease. Even if you look at the application of genomics and others, we really are looking at how do you define you know, risk and diseases and how do you actually treat them? And so consequently, the research, education, and care are focused on the treatment of the sick or diseases, less so on disease deterrence or prevention, and much less so until recently on socioeconomic factors that actually greatly influence health altogether. So take a step back. If you look at our last century, we have made enormous progress in traditional medicine, along with public health, better health, better nutrition, and better hygiene, but also a whole bunch of actions that include new therapy research as well as public health measures, such as our life expectancy in the past century has almost doubled. And in my field in cardiovascular disease, the mortality is reduced by 50%. It's really quite amazing. If you look at the left-hand side of the slide, the enormous progress in signs in mRNA vaccines during SARS-CoV-2, I mean, this lightning speed, which we got vaccines actually uh, approved. Genomics, genome editing and gene therapy, promising cures, big data intelligence, artificial intelligence, and of course, immunotherapy. But if you take a step back, except for the big data AI, most of these are focused on treating diseases and it's beneficial to individual with illness, clearly no doubt. Our question is, of course, one of the issues, all separate altogether, of course, is the cost and affordability and access of these treatment. But I think the bigger issue to me is the challenge of our time cannot be met by simply treating individual diseases. That's not to take away from the great work of nurses, physicians, et cetera. But we all recognize we're gonna make a difference we have to look at the whole issue somewhat differently. And listen here are some of the major challenges, by no means all of them. First of all, we are living still through COVID-19 and other emerging infections. Second, of course, non-communicable disease, diabetes, hypertension, cancer, you name it. Third, of course, is a global aging population. And of course, climate change, health equity, and you can probably put the long list there. So let me begin by talking about I mean, why are things changing? I think it's always been that way, but I think even now it's more, shall we say, there's more emphasis. First of all, because many of the diseases we've shown on this slide are really connected to community. It's not individual who just simply say, you know, I inherited this, I did something wrong. It's a community, community, community issue. And communities are more connected than ever particularly if you imagine what happens in pandemic and others. But also, the other thing I'm gonna emphasize on, which I know you know that, is much of the health is influenced by social environment. And so the question is, are we doing enough in this area? And are we moving traditional medicine towards more understanding that these root causes need to be addressed? So let's take um, COVID. You recognize this very well, I'm sure. And of course, last count, our country have, um, you know, um, pardon me, I want to make sure I get my numbers right. The last count in the globe, there's 600 million cases with 6.5 million deaths. And for our country, 100 million cases with 1 million deaths. I'm embarrassed to tell you these numbers, quite frankly, when you think about the magnitude of this. And UK, 23 million cases and 200,000 deaths. Now, so you can see that there is great emphasis in Asia, Europe, and North America, but we all know there's severe underreporting in Africa and many other under-resourced countries. So numbers are probably much, much higher than what we see here. But when you look at the last 21st century, starting 2003, and the number of outbreaks we had, 
with emerging infections and some re-emerging infections is very clear. This is only going to accelerate. In fact, Peter Sands and I wrote a paper in New England Journal of Medicine back then on the Ebola outbreak, looking at the same trend, and are saying that about how frequently it's increasing and that the likely and the amount of economic impact. So as you see in the bottom here, written by Baker and others, say, you know, these new era infectious disease that find by outbreaks of emerging and non and re-emerging endemic pathogens spreading quickly, aided by global connectivity, shift of ranges, as you all know, deforestation, urbanization, proximal contact between human and animals, the zoonosis, and of course, climate change. So I would say that we've said that in our publication that uh, COVID-19 is not a, not a black swan event. I think most of us are predicting it will happen again sometime in the future, near or far, but it's definitely going to occur again. But we also recognize that we've learned a tremendous amount from the pandemic. First of all, is the issue of inequity globally and even in every country in the United States, and I'm sure here as well. In the global inequity, if you look at just vaccination alone today, about 70% of the world's population, a little bit over, have one vaccine, vaccine dose, and about 65% have two or more fully vaccinated. But in Africa, only recently, it's gone up to 20%, was much lower a few months ago. But even then, today, eight out of 14 countries have less than 10% vaccinated. And I'll come back to this issue of nationalism and inequity. But the same can go for testing, but for treatment, you name it. But also, I think we all recognize this a phenomenal. Uh, there's a uh, lack of preparedness, a lack of uh, global strategy and coordination, such as people have to come very quickly together, even though WHO is the emergency response, but there was really no preparedness overall across all the countries. And so consequently, we have problem with coordination, but also R&D, vaccines, diagnostic, treatment, and countermeasures. And uh, of course, this problem is aggravated by a number of things, supply chain, you name it, but I think nationalism is one of the biggest problem. Countries are protecting their own citizen, nothing about the global equity issue. And consequently, you, the United States, and us bought off the vaccine very quickly and make it, you know, so there's not enough for the other countries. I was involved with, uh, and I still am, with the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board, which is co-convened by WHO and World Bank, with ACT Accelerator, with Jamie Farrar and others, and also in G20, um, high-level panel, and we looked at all these issues. And in fact, in the early days of Act A, we found COVAX, as you remember, and the idea of COVAX to say, let's ask the friends of COVAX, UK, Singapore, and others, who have enough resources to pull their resources together to go as a block to buy vaccines, and then to promise, you know, that once you vaccinate about 10, 20% of the global population, that's the number one before you vaccinate your own population. Of course, that failed miserably, as you know, and uh, everybody bought off the vaccines right away, and that's one of the bigger inequities. And of course, I think the big lesson we learned is leadership, social cohesion, and trust. I think we learned this in a massive way, not only here, but about all of medicine, is how do you get people to trust you? How do you get social cohesion to agree with what's good, how do you actually do what's good for public good? That I think we've learned dramatically. And there are a number of studies that demonstrated <clears throat> that those countries who did best are countries that have much better social cohesion. So it's not democracy, autocracy, or communism. It's actually depending on the country, how well the countries trust their government and how much they have social cohesion. And of course, governance and finance, and I think what I'm gonna to emphasize today is the lack of coordination 
and preparedness and integration of the health system. When you use the word health system globally, we think about the entire system, that's public health, healthcare delivery. And I think we've shown in our country, yours and certainly everywhere else, that is highly fragmented and not coordinated. So I would say that if you look at the lack of integration, sorry, I can't see my slides, I'm gonna read this, uh, between traditional medicine and public health, illustrated by a number of things, resource, allocation, work shortages, inadequate public health infrastructure, and I think important inadequate collaboration and communication between healthcare delivery system and public health. Now, Director General Tedros wrote about this. He says, industrialized countries confident in the medicalized nature of seeming strong, seemingly strong health systems lack the human and local touch shown by countries like Thailand, where health workers went door to door providing essential primary care services and looking for warning signs of infection at community levels. I think that says a lot about how we are different, at least we, the rich countries, are different perhaps from others. So um, I think fragmentation is a big issue. Fragmentation or entire system, in this case, uh, testing, tracking, uh, vaccines, distribution, and community engagement. And I won't have time to go over this. I'm sure we'll talk about this later, about how much we learn from the United States where you know, CDC tried to have its own testing and failed, and then tried to commerce, get commercial sources. And of course, the academic health sciences systems or centers, your NHS equipment was doing their own work, non-coordinated with public health, and it was the whole thing was just fragmented and not really achieving the resource that's needed that uh, look at screening for various parents vaccination, you name it. And then finally, of course, is the data issue. And you know, I know you appreciate this because the data was so fragmented in our country that there's really no coordinated collection. We have a public health system that is, you all know about CDC, it's start to be the jam, the model of public health. And of course, we've shown that it has many frailties. You know, early in CDC, the way to communicate between CDCs was using fax machines. And that's well known, right? And so it needs to be better resource, better workforce, and better integration. But then we have state health systems and local county and city department of health. And because they're not all coordinated, and of course the academic centers are collecting a lot of data, but not only are they not coordinated together, they're not working with the government. And so there's a lot of things lost. We don't know a lot of things about inequities, access, vaccines, you name it. So lots of lessons learned. And I think that the issue here is, in the future, we really need data integration. All right, but I'm here not to talk about COVID, but also about health as a whole. And we all know that 60% of disease burden globally are from non-communicable diseases. And 40% are from communicable diseases, which I talked about, but included in this category are maternal, neonate, and nutritional diseases. So clearly we're dealing with big issues, uh, you know, in the, in the health beyond emerging infections. And of course, when you look at both our countries, we look very much alike. The NCDs are the majority burden between cancer, cardiovascular, uh, musculoskeletal mental health, and of course, respiratory, and others. But I would like to point out further to look deeper into this issue, the challenge we face. First, life expectancy, the drop in life expectancy we've seen in the last few years. Second is maternal morbidity and mortality, which is unbelievably high in our country. And third, of course, is the whole concept of deaths of despair. I'll talk a few minutes about that, and the mistrust and misinformation, and certainly the social determinants. I think it's important to point out, as I've always said, there's no health equity unless you have social equity. And so when people talk about health equity, we think about doing all the things we want to do around medicine, 
but really we need to do a lot more about our social and economic challenges we faced for our population. So there we go. United States. Again, it's an embarrassing data that we've seen a drop in life expectancy for two consecutive years, three years. Well, you can argue a million people die during COVID, but we all know that it's only part of the problem. Our problem is huge because if you look at, I said zip code is more important than genetic code. If you look at life expectancy, even in one city between two different zip codes, you can have a 15 year life expectancy difference. So those people who live in marginalized a population who live in poor socioeconomic conditions are a lot more at risk for illness and death than those who live in fact in the more affluent part of our country. And of course, we have seen traditionally certain populations such as Native Americans and, Native, uh, and Alaskan Natives with life experience of just 65 years. And so when you look at what's going on and also in your country, to my knowledge, life expectancy has been stagnant, but you also seen tremendous differences in 20 years depending on geographic locations. And certainly COVID contributed to it, but you can see the highs and lower areas of deprivation, the same issue that we face with. Now, part of the reason of course is NCDs diabetes, hypertension. So despite all the good work traditional medicine is doing in treating, we're not preventing sufficiently these. But one of the phenomenon I think illustrates very vividly about the social economic problems is the phenomenon of death of despair. You might have read the book about this. And the phenomenon that more and more people are dying in the United States, I think to some extent this country too, from drug overdose, alcoholism, suicide, and the liver disease. And it happens to every single race. Yes, indeed, drug addiction, what we call substance abuse disorder, happens more in the black and uh, other population. But this illness of death of despair happens quite frequently in white men who are undereducated, and so I think this is a reflection of what's going on in our society. The, the despair, the lack of feeling of optimism in your future, the social economic challenges are caused, expressed in my opinion in deaths and diseases. And in the United Kingdom, certainly Anna in Scotland, I, I think that you are also facing very similar issues as the United States. And maternal health. I mean, I don't know how to explain this, except that this has got to be an issue that's really rooted in, I would say, racism. You know, the fact that you're dealing with non-Hispanic black maternity, which is higher than any country, compared to low-income countries, we're among the worst. And not seen in the white population is something that we're still trying to grapple with, what the problems are. So it comes now to this whole discussion of social factors. And you know, we all know about social determinants of health, which are listed all here, which as you know, through many studies, these social factors influence health and health outcomes. But I wanna emphasize that these are due to social inequalities, not just simply factors we use in practice. That in fact, at least in our country, one root cause is systemic racism. And so when you look at what we have to do, it requires actions beyond medicine, certainly within medicine and beyond medicine. So for quite a while, um, we at the National Academy of Medicine or used to as Institute of Medicine have been writing about this. This is a paper by Karen DeSalvo, who is, was one of the, I think, Deputy Secretary of Health in the Obama administration. She's now working at Google. She wrote this paper talking about how public health need to evolve into public health 3.0. So back in 1988, our report says the future of public health should have more preventive services 
going from the earlier part of uh, you know, epidemiology, antibiotics, and others to surveillance, access to care. But in 2012, we said, you really need to bring in into public health, health equity, social determinants, and start thinking about accountable health communities. So public health 3.0. Likewise, the medical community is beginning to recognize the importance of social determinants. Here I've showed you two citations of papers written in the medical literature that says, oh yes, uh, when you do a survey, 80% of the respondents of hospitals says, yes, uh, we are committed to development process to systematically address social determinants as a part of clinical care. That's from Deloitte. And then in New England Journal of Medicine, 91% believe it will improve outcomes and 56% will improve patient satisfaction. So appears to be good uh, recognition of this. But the question is, what we do with this uh, is the real challenge, I believe. So I think what's very clear to me is where we now need to move more and more towards the whole issue of community and social care along with healthcare. We have parallel processes. We have public health, the healthcare delivery, and of course we have community health which is sitting somewhere between public health and health delivery. Because community health are the communities that are organizing themselves to have more cultural sensitive approach and provision of care. And so there's been now emergence of community health workers and they organize around either NGOs. In Durham, North Carolina, where I live, there's about 100 NGOs that are involved with uh, diabetes, you name it. And there are also care delivery systems like Duke trying to work community health and sending people to community. And of course, there's public health. And I think the need to integrate all these things is clearly, clearly very important. Back in 2012, when we talk about the future of public health and healthcare, our academy has already said we should integrate these two. And it's the future of what we call population health. And here the requirements of integration is a shared goal that what we're interested in is the health of the population, community engagement, leadership and collaboration between public health and care delivery, and of course, sustainability. And then in the, the next paper we wrote in 2019 is the importance of integrating social care with healthcare. Now, in our countries, these are through different agencies and different parts of our government. And so reimbursement is separate. So we refer, frequently refer patients who need social care to social services. And when we look at our investment, our cost of care is the highest in the world, approximately 20% of our GDP. But our social care expenditure is the middle of the rank of all the countries in the world. So if you look at other countries, such as France, their investment in social care is much higher than in healthcare. I think the message is very clear. You can't separate those two. If you want to prevent illness, you ought to really work on social care first and the social conditions by which people live. So we wrote effective integration of social care and delivery of healthcare requires effective interpersonal teams advanced data and technology and financing model that incorporates social care facilities. Long way to go. <clears throat> so what I want to put forward to get today, which I know you would know well, is the concept of population health. And the idea that we now need to look at population health, which includes individual health, but includes all the other things in prevention, you name it. So the entire community's in reducing health inequities, and of course, preventive tools and health promotion, and consider social determinants. Now, Richard was very kind to accept a perspective or viewpoint I wrote in Lancet, but I said, public health is a convergence, uh, population health, of public health, social, economic, environmental determinants, 
and healthcare altogether influencing health outcomes. So the other thing important is of course integration of data. We're collecting data everywhere and we are now a data-driven uh, health system and we have all that information about patients, not only healthcare point of care, but also all the other health-related information, including, you know, uh, behaviors, wearables, you name it, but also public health data. I think together you can do a tremendous amount in terms of data-driven decisions and data-driven signs and health. So I would say community data allows us to understand patient environment and system which they function. When I was at Duke, Robert Caleb, my good friend who's now the FDA commissioner, and myself and others, we took geospatial mapping by taking data from the city and county looking at, and then data from the healthcare system, where we happen to have 93% population under our care in Durham city and county. And we merged that social data, including criminal law, uh, uh, law and, and justice data together and start mapping out where the food, access to good food, diabetes, where the pregnant women are and where the access to clinic and we started trying to redo our care delivery system. So data is really important. And then in terms of creating policy, I think getting that data and the data during COVID, I think speaks volumes of why these data should be integrated and should be moved forward in a collective manner in decision-making. So now the question, I'm sorry to disappoint you, I can't say that it has had its day, but it has to change. There's no question if we were to remain this way, it would have its day, but if we are now ready to make changes, it will need to revisit the fundamental ethos by extending its approach and also new partnerships and new tools. Now, so I think C.K. Francis, who's African-American physician, wrote this paper about medical ethos and social responsibility in clinical medicine, well-written, and I put in quotes. There's a need to balance medicine's devotion to well-being of the patient and primacy of patient-physician relationship against with the need to meet healthcare needs of society. So the challenge facing the medical profession in the new millennium is to establish an equilibrium between their responsibility to assure quality healthcare for the individual while affecting societal changes to achieve health for all. I think it's very well said. That I believe is where we need to be. The question is how? Well, so clearly we need to bring these pieces together and I won't have time to read through all this. And also to look at, here's a slide I want to spend a minute talking about because first of all, if you look at how to coordinate clinical services, that is putting more combining clinical care with medical services, such as counseling, outreach, social programs, not as two separate, but combine them together with healthcare and these services in social care, but also supporting coordinating community health workers by using community assessment, which we do, we have to do it as uh, on a regular basis in the United States to look at planning and development health programs and clinical visits to identify and address health problems within the community. We have to use a population perspective to look at clinical practice, look at population-based data to find all high-risk patients that you can identify to much earlier prevention, screening, or treatment programs. And this is where possibly even genomics can be helpful in this in the future. Identify those who are high risk, polygenic risk scores, and started really funding them in terms of prevention. And of course, promotion and protection, particularly looking at efficacy and education. This one area I'm gonna focus on, for example, I use your local smoke-free Liverpool as an example, whereby the legislation both medical community and public health together 
move towards local legislation, smoke-free workplace policy, and smoke cessation to the residents. Okay, so where do we begin? So I'm gonna flip quickly through the next part of my talk, which is we have to begin at the root, the foundations of traditional medicine, which is academic medicine. This is how we teach our clinicians. This is how we do our research. This is how we provide care. So that we need to look at from academic medicine's bench to bedside model and the academic health sciences centers or NHS or equivalent health systems, which are teaching this to the students and doing research, I think they need to change. Too often, they see this ivory towers, certainly in our country, and not, in fact, rooted, in fact, in community. So as Richard said, over 10 years ago, I wrote this paper in Lancet to say, transformation of medicine, the role of academic health science centers, and I went from bench to bedside to population for discovery to care. So not only are we saying we really emphasize translation, but moving this translation into communities and looking at global health and population health. So that was the concept then. And, the, and these systems are the system integrators that can bring together all these pieces together in order to improve population health. Well, in October, Richard's kind enough to accept my follow-up paper to say we now to revisit 10 years later. Academic medicine has to change even further. And now it has bench to bedside to population to society. Because my thesis, unless we address societal issues, we're always going to be challenged with trying to catch up with improving health. But if we use leverage our power to address social issues, we can do a lot more. So this is the model which you find in the paper in Lancet back in October and this one for the lecture. That is that I've extended now from discovery translation to implementation to public health and to really address social issues. And the integrated instance I, which I'll talk about is for academic medicine to embrace data science to embrace convergence science, to embrace equity, diversity, and inclusion, and of course, so important in training at the future workforce. So let's talk about the areas of emphasis. Um, to, to do so, I think we need these four areas of emphasis in academic medicine. First, convergence science. Beyond health sciences, to bring in other sciences to really address the many issues that we face in health. Second, of course, is to understand how important data is and how data can be used with digital technology to drive the change in health. Third is community engagement and the issue of equity. And finally, training the future workforce. So convergent science. Um, we wrote a National Academy of Science and Engineering Medicine back in um, 2016 a report about pop of convergence. And MIT, through Phil Sharp and uh, others, also wrote about convergence future of health. Now, here those reports says we need to go beyond interdisciplinary collaboration. It's integration into what we do, not just collaborating, invite people in. We have to look at all these discipline as a whole to solve the problem that we have. And the paper I I mentioned earlier that I wrote in Lancet that says we need to reimagine population health in terms of convergence. That is a practice and the research across scientific research policy, implementation science, and of course, all these different sciences in order to improve health and healthcare. And so to do that, I think academic medicine needs to now work beyond traditional medicine to build convergence by working first Many of the uh, NHS are rooted, in fact, in the university of the Academic Health Science Center. They can work with the schools of law, engineering policy, as well as external organizations, but also they should develop internal core capabilities in those areas in order to really deliver 
the kind of research and care that's needed for population science. On digital science, it must create the data infrastructure interoperability to capture, standardize, and harmonize point of data care with community, but also collect socioeconomic data, genomic information, and broader data sets. Together, you can imagine how powerful the information can be in looking at determinants of health. And it needs to data share and have data information exchange and to integrate that data, as we said, into policy making, intervention, planning. And finally, of course, data analytics and artificial intelligence to generate new evidence to drive decision support through machine learning or AI. And of course, it's really important that our workforce is adequately trained in the use of data science and being able to use digital technology. In community engagement, I think all academic medicine must really go upstream to address the issue of social determinants. That includes the issues of housing, job creations, food security, education, and others. So our doctors now in the United States are trained to ask this question and now electronic record has also incorporated this question about asking patients about where they live, where the jobs are, and social issues. And hopefully that will sensitize them in terms of decisions about the individual care. But I think that's not sufficient. That's, we need to go much deeper into the entire question of the social determinants and to have an enterprise-wide approach in engaging community and have true partners and collaborations and finally, as I look at Duke University, my own experience, we were the anchor institution, we're the big show in town. I hired 25,000 people. I cared for everybody. We had the resources. So our job is to help local economy and to work with the community to improve, to create jobs, to create equity, et cetera. So I think academic medicine has to look at their responsibility that way as well. And of course, look internally. Do we have culture of diversity, equity, and inclusion for our workforce in everything that we do? And of course, we need to address some of the biggest essential threats, such as climate change, um, you know, social inequity, and others. So my final point is emphasis on society. As I said, there will be no health equity unless there's social equity. We certainly see this dramatically in our country. And so we need to advance policy and solutions that promote social equity, cohesion, and trust. And we also need to address things like climate change, sustainability, and also mitigate social implications of emerging science, such as genome editing, artificial intelligence. There's a lot of un unintended consequence on social effects. And most importantly, or maybe equally importantly, address misinformation and public trust. That's part of the science that's needed in academic medicine, which needs to develop to understand behavioral science, communication science, and to gain public trust. And I'm sure we can talk about this in our, in our uh, discussion period. So let me end by saying, here's how academic medicine can make a difference. If we begin to look at our research we look at our practice, we look out willing to integrate and put our resources in it. I think we go a long way, but we need to train a new generation of clinicians who are more socially connected and community oriented, who are skilled in communication to the public, who understand behavioral sciences. We need to work with new partners to create new curricula and competencies in team science and interprofessional education but also educating social inequities in ethics and quantitative science. And we need to expand our workforce that does diversify so that we can see they reflect the community in which we serve the population. A lot more diversification in race, ethnicity, and in fact, in interest. And of course, we really need to rebuild public health workforce. Also 10 years ago, the Lancet Commission on the Health Profession Education, I think was a landmark paper. And I know that the author, Ulio Frank, is celebrating 
10 years of the meeting coming up in November, which if you should look forward to it because they have advances further. What I did is I used their diagram that says, to train effective workforce education systems must be aligned with health system needs. What I added to the side to say, now more than ever, we must also take care to be aligned with community population and societal needs. And that'd be what I'd be pushing at that meeting to say, yes, you need to train them about system needs, but system needs are those to meet societal needs. So a new type of clinician, um, team science, interprofessional education, social inequities and ethics, and quantitative science are the three things I wanna emphasize. Just like in the last line, competence in the use of digital science because more and more we're gonna use digital health, telehealth to treat patients, particularly in remote areas. But I think that my opinion is, and I wrote in the paper in October, that we should take our trainees and expose to them in direct experience in communities and social issues, even before they learn how to use the stethoscope, because that's only a tool. I think the more important issue is to understand who you're serving and what you're trying to serve with. So I would love to see the curriculum preclinical years not to do a physical exam, but actually spend a good amount of time in the community they serve and really understand the social and economic and other challenges and have ongoing practitioners continue to train in this area and of course skills in communication. Uh, this is my second last slide, which talks about this very interesting paper written by Kirsten Bing, uh, Bibbins Domingo, who's now the editor-in-chief of JAMA. She's a world-class African-American scholar and leader in the area of uh, public health and social health. And she wrote this paper talking about the new type of practitioner, what she called physician public health practitioner, which is missing academic medicine career track. So a track in which the people are taught not only to direct, directly care, but understand public health and others, whereby they can create a collective impact model and provide technical assistance to community practitioners and practice this together in kind of the thing we're talking about. Now, I don't think one can have one form of physician all, but I think the whole idea is to begin to integrate or better integrate these pieces. And maybe this new generation of the physician public health would be a good bridge between traditional medicine and public health. To summarize, I think I would say we need to retain the important attributes of traditional medicine, individual patient care, patient-centered care, and understanding we need to treat illnesses. But traditional medicine has evolved to demands of our current world. The challenges of our time, which I mentioned already, are connected to change, change our communities, cultures, and society. And to tackle this, medicine need to increase integration of public and community health. And so it can define academic medicine by traditional model by extending spent the bedside model to integrate population and societal health. And this can be accomplished by, as I said, conversion science, data science, community engagement, and education workforce for the future. So thank you very much for uh, your indulgence. I hope I have opened up some good conversation and uh, maybe provoked some thoughts about has traditional medicine had its day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Richard, I think Victor Hugo at the panel, and then I'm the last of our three panelists to join us. Um, let me very briefly introduce our, our three respondents. Um, the charge that we've had, in Victor's words, is it needs to change. 
traditional academic medicine needs to change. So we're going to have three um, brief responses. Professor Adiba Kamral Zaman uh, graduated from Monash University and trained in infectious diseases and internal medicine. Um, she's currently the chairman of the Malaysian AIDS Foundation and executive council member of the Malaysian AIDS Council. Uh, she's a former dean of the faculty of medicine at the University of Malaya. Uh, professor Rekai Dendona, who will be speaking second, is a professor of health metric sciences at the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation at the University of Washington in Seattle. Uh, she's also a professor of, at the Public Health Foundation of India, based in New Delhi, India. She's chair of the Global Burden of Disease India Injury Expert Group um, and has her, served on several uh, academic institutions at the Sydney School of Public Health and the George Institute of International Health in India. And third, Professor Ian Buchan, who's joined us on the panel here, um, is Chair of Public Health and Clinical Informatics at the University of Living Liverpool and the founding Executive Dean of its Institute of Population Health. Um, perhaps what he's most well known for is that in the 2000s he built one of the United Kingdom's most successful health informatics research groups at the University of Manchester and that became the forerunner of the UK's National Health Data Research organization. So let's start with Adiba and then we'll go to Rakai and then to Ian. Thank you. This is our for a fantastic lecture. There's a lot to unpack there. Um, but first I must say as a uh, clinician who's since ventured into public health, I completely agree with you. And uh, I guess in terms of um, moving forward, I think it's the how. How do we um, you know, do what, what we all understand needs to be done, whether it's in the health systems or, if I may, focus on that fourth point, which is to prepare the future workforce. Um, as a former dean, I think um, we're always struggling how to fit in all those, um, you know, basic sciences that's necessary to prepare our students, how to prepare them for patient care, but as you said, more in, um, increasingly the uh, preventive care. And, and now we're adding in data science and social determinants of health um, and health inequities. It's, it's hard to pack that all into a five year medical program to adequately prepare them and not just superficially, you know, produce a, um, a medical graduate who's not only competent, but is, is aware of, uh, you know, all this risk factors and then social determinants that, that you have um, so eloquently outlined. So to me, I think that for especially in um, low and middle income countries where medical schools are still struggling to provide even the basics of, um, you know, what's needed in terms of knowledge and skills and competencies, how to, how to pivot their curriculum from a traditional curriculum um, to to one that's that's more all encompassing. I, I say this as someone who did that ten years ago. Well, nearly ten years ago at our own medical school, and you know, from from the the uh, recommendations from the Lancet Commission to to um, to integrate and to implement that was no easy feat. And and I noticed that. Um, you know, again, the emphasis on, on low and middle income countries, Vietnam, there was there was a paper in the Lancet uh, Regional Health recently has just started sort of uh, implementing those recommendations from the Lancet Commission. This is like a good 10, 15 years later. So there's only always going to be a lag from, you know, recommendations that we hear today to particularly medical schools in, in low and middle income countries where we're struggling to provide clinical care as well as write curriculums, as well as train the teachers. Um, so, so, so that's where I'm coming. I'm sorry to be very negative, but uh, <laughs> I think the reality is. And then on top of that, you know, there's a separation 
between um, clinical teaching as well as public health teaching. Um, you know, there are different models around the world, of course, but how to bring them back again together to, to even teach the basics. So, um, you know, we, we all agree, I think this is what we need to do, but um, it, it's how and how much, I think, um, do we, uh, you know, um, have this in, in our, both in our curriculum and as well as our health systems. I'll stop there, Richard. Thank you very much, Diva, for that reality check. <laughs> Let's go to Professor Dandona. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity, Professors Horton and Solomon. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, as a brief introduction, I have over 25 years of experience across population and health systems research in India. So I bring perspectives from, from that uh, viewpoint. Uh, to me, the change in the model from 2010 to now in the academic health sciences system is actually five Cs. Convergence, collaboration, community, continuum, and all of these forces in the wake of the big C, COVID-19. If I were to summarize this in one line, that would be collaborate and converge for continuum of health for and with the community. So thank you very much, Professor Zhao, for highlighting this change so beautifully and effectively in your talk today. The proposed framework is a dream for anyone wanting to improve health of the society in a sustainable, equitable, and of course, inclusive manner. But the biggest challenge, however, is the how of it. How to operationalize and sustain this model and thinking when our current approach is simply fragmented and disjointed at all levels? I have four points for consideration. Firstly, the system's approach to achieve health by addressing equity, diversity, and inclusion is not debatable. The social determinants of health have become ingrained in our thinking. But how do we ensure that these are also ingrained in our actions? How do we address the social determinants of health that will most impact on a variety of diseases and conditions? We do need to reorient ourselves to start from social determinants of health and not from disease or condition as the starting point of our actions. And this is where I see the need and the power of the proposed model, the integration at that horizontal level to influence the vertical. But how do we do that? And who does that is the big question. Secondly, the fragmentation of health services research is for all to see. You've shown it very beautifully in your slides, the vertical focus on disease and within that mostly on clinical care. Now, how do we address this verticalization practically? I'll take an example here. There's significant work being done on disrespectful maternal care in the developing countries, and rightly so. However, what is not seen is that this disrespect is within the context of disrespect for all patients, mothers included. What we need is to make respectful care available for all to be equitable and inclusive. Mothers, elderly, children, differently able for all and also respectful care at the time of death and for the disease. Focusing on any one group for changes at that larger health services level is neither sustainable nor appropriate many times. And then there's a big divide between mental and physical health, which all of us know is a major barrier to actually improve population health. Third point, for the most part, we do not yet know how to engage with the community beyond having community health workers in our settings. The community is missing in our decision making, in our planning and interpretation of research and translation of that research into action. How do we then initiate meaningful community engagement? There is evidence that involvement of people with lived experience can and does make better research and action. There are examples of self uh, harm reduction initiatives, which engage people with lived experience and also initiatives of improved bereavement care in case of stillborn babies by engaging with and learning from bereaved parents, but we have a really long way to go. Lastly, I would request to add the dimension of quality to the proposed discovery to society framework. It's imperative that whatever we do across the continuum of improving health of the society has to be of reasonable quality. In the developing country context, we have suffered and continue to suffer from poor quality in clinical care and poor quality of our research. A closer look at any global report for any disease or condition will show the extent of modeling that is needed to arrive at a variety of estimates for action. And many times, it's not about the availability of data, 
but it's about the poor quality of available data that limits its use. India is a good example of that. And the resources spent on these data are enormous, but to what and to whose benefit is the question. I would end by saying thank you to you again, Professor Zhao, for your inspiring talk. Traditional medicine certainly needs to evolve in real soon. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you. And thank you, Professor Zhao, for an inspirational talk. Before I criticize the pace of evolution of academic uh, medicine, I'd just like to say how grateful I am to have had a convergence science career between clinical medicine, public health, and data science. It struck me at the very start of your talk, the first to no harm, primum non nocere, as I was a medical student releasing statistical software at the time, being allowed to pursue uh, adventures in software engineering, statistical inference. At the beginning of the PC revolution in 1987, I was very concerned, concerned about the proliferation of data that was inevitable in a world that struggled with basic statistical inference, in health systems that had a basic divide between primary and secondary care. Despite basic ability to connect, there wasn't uh, consistent referral pathways. And it strikes me that that's a very long time ago. There were three principal components I was lacking. There was the ability to program prevention, precision, and payment. If we were to have an operating system con for convergent care that is socially grounded, could we have that civic programmable trio? I think COVID-19 has moved us a little closer. To think of prevention, we have uh, so many challenges in human nature that looks at the near-term risks, that doesn't want to look at the background of the mounting risks that won't have an outcome very soon. So underinvests in those individually and collectively. Yet all of us are clickbait for buying things we don't really need. Billions of pounds and dollars are spent on AIs uh, that encourage us to do that, to look at things that we don't really need to look at, but not necessarily to take the regular preventive actions to change the rhythms of our lives that would make a difference to those long-term outcomes. Might be the interaction of sleep hygiene, physical activity, and alcohol intake, increasingly instrumented in our lives directly and indirectly. We have a medtech world that seeks biomarkers of emerging risks, but just think with the technology I'm wearing on my wrist, there'll be rhythm to rhythm correlations that are very rarely studied. We tend to look at rhythms of fixed outcomes, but we may be instrumenting the difference between destructive and constructive stress that has near term use to the productivity and well being in our daily lives. Yet many of those companies and data scientists are not currently part of academic health systems. Maybe they should be. Precision. Do we really have a destination of precision medicine or even precision convergence? What precision do we look at? We've made huge progress in biological precision for clinical transactions. So a doctor's eye view of precision in pharmacogenomics, for example, is getting a lot better. But if I consider common uh, multimorbidities, common complexity, the things that go really wrong for a lack of precision, the cardiometabolic consequences of antipsychotic medication, for example, that mount very quickly, that are subject to dissonant prescribing between physical and mental health care. Yet the data to make those prescriptions more convergent and the deprescriptions more convergent requires uh, precision journeys, not precision transactions. So can we infer the combinations of interventions that need to be made more precise? We start therefore to look at the inputs of data that are much 
more like an avatar than a set of records, i.e. a set of predictive models combined with fixed records that are plotting different potential outcomes and require very complex counterfactual reasoning about them. That requires us then to have some of those taps into the rhythms of life and much more look at the upstream determinants of health alongside those precision journeys. The union of biology, behavior, and environment is, in my mind, from public health, precision. Then uh, payment. Why do I say payment? I, I know colleagues in the US have, have struggled and pushed very hard, including your good offices, to move from paying for volume to paying for value. But who's value? You can consider value in this room, a subgroup, you can consider value of a fixed population. But if we really want value, we also have to consider the value of the life course, which means a much more focus on maternal and child health. Those value calculations have quite a lot of uncertainty, but we can bring the data and the decision makers together. As a public health physician working a lot on data science, I often say don't, don't start the conversation with data, start it with action. And how do we bridge the data action gap? How do we move from incessant description of inequality that ticks the box of ref and academic papers? Um, but I don't want just another description of inequality. I want programmable equity. I want to be able to converge the understanding of outcome variation, uh, the explanation of that variation at a population level with the understanding of mechanisms. So I see the pursuit of deep biomeds and an understanding those mechanisms is deeply entwined with population level data science. All of that requires us to be able to combine intelligence, to combine actions. But how big do we cast the net? Do we need just another bigger database? Do we need a global database? I hear this a lot. No, if you're too far from the action, you'll miss the opportunity to improve, as, as Raki pointed out, the data quality, the collection of metadata, the interpretation that's contextually relevant. We have the opportunity to develop academic health systems that are like nodes on a grid, like a World Wide Web of academic health systems that can borrow strength, predictive strength statistically, but can also be a more coordinated global network of natural and designed experimentation. Thank you. So Tom, um, we've got uh, many people online and uh, do we have some questions we, from online? Uh, yeah, we've got a, a, a great selection of questions online. I'm sure there'll be some in, in the room too. Um, and some of these relate to things we've heard from all the speakers and, and some of the earlier comments. Um, one thing that you didn't pick up on, this is from Pandiyan Natarajan, they've not said where they're from. Um, they're looking at COVID-19, the morbidity and mortality, and the single most important cause was overweight, obesity and the consequences. Uh, much of which relates to unhealthy lifestyle. You didn't specifically uh, focus on lifestyle. And the question is, should we be laying more emphasis on the need for lifestyle modification? And then I might add, and how do healthcare professionals get more involved in that? And while you're thinking of answering that, let me just say to the audience, please put your hand up and I will try and spot you and bring you into the discussion um, when we're ready. So let's uh, start with that. Victor. Last question. <clears throat> uh, no question that we know that people with comorbidities are at greater risk. And also, by the way, uh, aging as well. And in the former, uh, there's no question that improvement lifestyle, reduction in NCDs can be critically important for COVID or for all other reasons. So I, I don't think there's any debate over that one. Panel. Again, um, going back to medical school, we don't teach all these things, you know, um, the importance of nutrition, the importance of exercise, 
very well, at least not in, in the curriculum that I'm familiar with. So, you know, we, we and, um, and also at the policy level, um, um, many in um, low and middle income countries don't, for instance, I think in my country, there's still sugar subsidy instead of sugar tax. Um, and then we wonder why our, our population is 50% uh, obese. So um, all those things that are intertwined, but going back to the very basics, uh, we don't teach it very well. Overweight and obesity disproportionately affects the most deprived populations. Yet we have uh, a risk of creating automation of blame in individualized lifestyle feedback loops, rather than thinking of our collective uh, energy balance of policies that work in particular contexts that helps the most vulnerable to resist over malnutrition. In my own area, Merseyside, uh, looking at data today, a point 0.6% segment, I think 11,829 to be precise, individuals we identified from linked data, um, have very complex lives. So they're very challenged, have less control over their own opportunities to resist over malnutrition and consume 6% of the civic budget. Now, a third of that, 48% so of the, so 48 million out of 129 million for those people, uh, was the NHS, Department of Work and Pensions, uh, local authority budgets, etc. There's a need for a civic approach mm. to obesity and not automation of failed medicalization. Yeah, we need a partnership with government and currently we have a government that has threatened to roll back its anti-obesity strategy and a Prime Minister who when interviewed at the General, UN General Assembly today and asked about the idea of fairness said that that was an idea of the left so <laughs> if you if you if you don't have a civic partnership between a health system and a government then you're in trouble aren't you there's a question there please say who you are where you're from and your question will be very welcome thank you very much is this one Yes. Um, my name is Pooja Vetter. I'm a rheumatology clinician and I've just entered my second year of a PhD. And my question is about, at UCL, sorry. Um, my question is about protecting the vulnerable. And here I'm not talking about patients and populations, but actually academics. I think one of the things that has potentially not been explored on today is social media. And this has given us a massive platform of voice visibility to disseminate messages modern era of science communication but it's also a very vulnerable space and i wanted to give you an example i think um, stories are data with souls so i'll give you my own uh, at the beginning of the pandemic i published a letter in the lancet 400 words which took five days to recruit co-authorship to make them believe about two hours to write and it was published in about three days and it was about considering cytokine storm syndromes in COVID-19 and the consideration of immunomodulation and it provoked a lot of discussion because it was a hypothesis there was no data at that time and catalyzed immunomodulation into several clinical trials which we now know has been validated and vindicated but for me as an early career researcher the clinical chair of the ECR network at UCL it was a baptism of fire, a very rude awakening into academia, because on social media, I had death threats. I had, I had um, sort of almost a lot of questions about why I didn't have imposter syndrome. And as a non-white female, there is a pecking order of privilege going from white male all the way to black woman. And what was interesting for me is that I got a lot of criticism in terms of the question of why this was even an issue, but the credit went to, to other authors in the team, which I found fascinating. So how as a community are we gonna protect the academic voice, the free speech and hypotheses and generation of intellectual stimulation and discussion? Mm, that's a great question. Okay, I'm going to take a couple of questions from the audience and then um, why don't we go to Paul and then someone at the, at the back maybe? This one? Paul. Hi, yeah, I'm Paul Stewart, the Clinical Vice President at the Academy. Amazing talk, Victor, and uh, 
hugely impressive and thought-provoking. I, I suspect everybody in this room thinks that you're right. Um, the, the issue, and, and I do sympathise with Adiba as a former dean of two civic universities, is how do we really make this happen? You know, we all, we all are representative of a medical profession that is, by its definition, traditional, with, with some of these issues working slower than tectonic plates. You know, so, so to effect much needed and quick change in this space is, is really challenging. And maybe just getting your advice on on a little bit of how, how we, we, we might do that would be useful. I do think, you know, glass half full, we do have a unique opportunity at the moment, because at least in the UK, there has been some convergence of these structures with the development of integrated care systems. Um, and at least that does offer the opportunity for bringing social care city city councils together with your academic health science models to, to do that. The fear is that in a, an NHS system that's absolutely strapped for cash and plagued by waiting lists and, and still an emphasis on direct care, it will revert back to, you know, fights over budgets and these crucially important issues will remain and will just become a hamster wheel, you know, the old ways doing things and, and not getting anywhere. Um, so, so I think some, some thinking of how we can be radical, bringing, of course, regulators such as the GMC and others along with us would be, would, would be really helpful. Okay. Uh, one more. Look, Martin, I know you've got something. And then, and then there. Thanks. yes, please. Thanks, Martin McKee. Um, what is the purpose of academic medicine? And who do we need to help us to achieve it? And what can we offer them in return? That's a great question. And then we'll take one more and then back to the panel. Hi, um, I'm Kitty. I'm the fundraising officer from, from the Academy of Medical Sciences. Um, and another question that I have, which I don't, I think was sort of skirted around, and I think is often the elephant in the room in these discussions, is the role of late stage capitalism and how these systems interact. You mentioned that sort of civic agreement between government and medical bodies, but I think, you know, late stage capitalism is responsible for a lot of the health issues that we have on a global scale. And I think, how do we go about maybe prompting a rethinking of that as the sort of social order that we all prescribe to as a way of hopefully bettering the health of the global population? Back to the panel. Some challenging questions <laughs> right. there. Come on, Victor. Let me take on uh, some of these very difficult questions. By the way, I came to learn not to teach. So, <laughs> so let's have a conversation. So first of all, Richard, you should do a Lancet commission on those questions of how. Yeah. It's perfect, no really. Yeah. Yeah. Get a whole bunch of knowledgeable people to say, yeah. let's think about this. But I do want to respond to uh, Adiba's question and others. I think to think about teaching is a five year time span is way too limited. We talk about lifelong learning. Mm -hmm. And so you just don't leave the medical school and then you stop learning. So in fact, I think this is going to be a much longer proposition. However, I, I do believe that during the medical sc uh, school days is a time when they have to learn the principles and the values of medicine and the biology too. And so to me, uh, an exposure of the important issues to be emphasized is the way to go. So, for example, um, you have five years, we have United States four years, and then, of course, UK, you can say MBBS six years, right? So I guess we do need to look at what exactly do we mean by preclinical? What do you mean by clinical? Because a lot of time in clinical, at least in our case, we spend in hospitals with some experience in outpatient, and the preclinical is sitting in classrooms. I think that can be changed. Mm -hmm. So to me, one step of changing is within our own profession, kind of Martin's question about how do we make the changes together? Do we believe in it? And I think in our country, we have AAMC, the Association of American Medical Colleges. They do set the accreditation and the curriculum minimum requirement. So I think it's doable if you look at, okay, preclinical, you know, we're now doing problem-based learning. Do we have to sit in classroom and learn everything? Or do we actually look at problems that people solve the problems by learning through their own effort that reduces classroom class size? I mean, the time spent in classrooms. 
uh, community exposure. How much time do you need to really do this? Maybe throughout your entire preclinical to be able to do a project or to work with the community to understand this, right? Um, at Duke, we actually, if you ask me, we have about a two and a half year medical school wide because as far as education is concerned, because we spend, by the way, we're a little unusual than the, uh, unlike the others. We spend one year preclinical. Second year, we throw them to clinical work, mm -hmm. not starting years to say, how do you physical exam? You do that in first year. Anyway, third year, you take the time to do research, which is what we're known for because we produce more physician scientists. And fourth year, do more clinical, but guess what? Most of the time to spend in traveling to get interview for internships. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> and so if you ask the time effectively spent, I say, if I was a student, I want my tuition back, right? And I, so we need to treat these things are within our own control that we can do this. And then of course, in a postgraduate training, again, we have a entity called ACGME for graduate medical training. And there again, you can design it. So at least in the training piece, it's a lifelong journey mm -hmm. that you can design and not have to work thing that you got to pack everything, but continue to expose them to it. That would be my answer. But, mm -hmm. but Richard, I still think you should have a commission okay. to look at this. Okay, what about these other questions? Protecting the vulnerable um, academic, early career researcher who's putting themselves out there um, and like never before during the pandemic, we, one of the positive signs of the pandemic was that we did see people from the medical community on the radio, on television, engaged mm -hmm. very, very strongly, but it comes at a potential cost. How do we, how do we think about training, preparing early career researchers, members of the health professions for that greater public engagement and exposure to social mm -hmm. media? Would you one of you like to try to answer <laughs> And <laughs> let me also, yeah. Um, yeah. Professor Dandona as well, yeah. who's um, online, any of you. I, I'm happy yeah. to take that one. As a recipient of two death threats, it, it's a badge of honor. It, it, we, I know there's lots of people in this room <laughs> through COVID-19 have, um, have suffered the slings and arrows of outrageous Twitter. But seriously, generosity of spirit is part of the etiquette, I think, of being in a caring profession and includes caring for one another. As we move through purpose-led innovation at extraordinary pace in COVID-19, we did see a lot of generosity of spirit. Um, and to Paul's point, I think we did see a remarkable mobilization of can-do. I know in, in my own health system, I had no integrated care record. Um, and the extreme needs, the highest mortality rate at one point uh, from hospitalized COVID-19. We had an integrated care record stood up in 90 days, a gargantuan effort from a lot of people who hadn't worked together at that pace before. And that created a combined intelligence system for decision making across public health, clinical services and social care that created a camaraderie. And to me, that camaraderie rises above any of the, the, the surface of social media. So I think resisting that extremism at the same time as educating our next generation in an etiquette of generosity of spirit in academic healthcare yeah. is, is very important. Very good. And who's going to pick up the question of what's the purpose of academic medicine? Uh, Mark. Mark. Mm. She's online. Professor Dandona, would you like to tackle that one from from uh, Professor Martin McKee at the London School? Thank you for that. Um, if I may just tackle a few more along with, is that okay? It's very difficult to participate when someone's online. Is that okay? I, I just wanted to, uh, you know, briefly touch upon the question of obesity. Um, you know, in our settings where I come from, we still deal with malnutrition, even though obesity is 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 a big challenge and malnutrition for mothers, unfortunately, only those. But what I wanted to bring about is that this lifestyle is also beyond health. We're talking about integration today, the horizontal look at what our health needs. It's also about 
for example, urban planning getting involved because obesity is nutrition on one side and no exercise on the other. And that's a challenge that we continue to struggle with, um, with uh, you know, hardly any place to walk. And if you do walk, there is a serious risk of someone in being, you know, being dead in a road crash. So there are issues in terms of obesity beyond nutrition as well. I just wanted to point that out. I also wanted to say briefly on the training, um, uh, the preclinical training or the clinical training. I think what's also important is we also need to start talking about this behavior and attitude training, uh, whether it's at preclinical level or clinical level, where we are teaching our health providers when they're getting trained to look at that patient, the person walking in, and not necessarily the fracture walking in or a, or, or a case of depression walking in. I think this has to come come at the time of medical training or, or paramedical training, doesn't matter. We really need to start talking about training them about looking at the person, because if you do that, it's difficult then to miss a pregnant woman who probably also is showing signs of domestic abuse, but you're just looking at pregnancy and letting her go, uh, where you could have actually tackled much more than pregnancy for this, this woman. Where does all this go? Um, difficult question to answer. Um, honestly, have been struggling myself with translation of whatever we've learned, whether it's at population level or health systems level. Um, but I am totally sold out with the idea and that's what we've been trying to do for many years. Uh, but unfortunately, I really do not have a good answer to how. The only how that comes to my mind within our settings where uh, we are also, you know, resource is an issue, is how the governments uh, in our settings can be pushed in this, uh, you know, our academic medicine and governments can be pushed in this direction to funders. Uh, funders were able to actually translate team science or translation science into action, are able to give funds to put it together uh, for us to actually improve practice in, instead of just putting it together in theory. Thank you. Can I try to tackle uh, Dr. Dandona's question about how do you get it done? Mm. And of course, I don't have an answer, but let's at least have a discussion. Mm. And also Martin's question about like medicine. So Martin, yours first. When I think about in the United States, before Flexner, we had no systematic way of approaching teaching, nor for that matter, research, right? And uh, so we had a lot of trade organizations that put people through apprenticeship and they're not practicing medicine. So Flexer said this should be science-based and put it in universities, hence the word academia, right? So science, um, research, and therefore the practice of training or practice of medicine. That's how academic medicine started. So if you look at the evolution of this, it went from medical school university where the students go to a hospital to learn clinical work to perhaps the concept that Rich talked about some a decade more ago of integrating the academic piece with the healthcare delivery piece to create something that's more evidence-based and drive more research. I still think that's the right model. The question is now, are we doing the right kind of research? Are we teaching the right kind of clinical care? But that's the history of academic medicine. And I'd be delighted to hear your, Tom, or maybe yours, or any one of your perspective. But I think there is a value of academic medicine. That's the organization of science-based practices and research that can influence the way we practice medicine. Yeah. Martin's question is really provocative in a good way. Because I think it forces us back to the exam question of how do we know we've got a health system that is a system? You ask what the purpose is of the academic health system. In my mind, the purpose is to co-advance population health, releasing potential population health gain, patient care, and civic well-being in synergy. How can you link those together how do you measure that you've linked those together and i think we've discussed some examples of where they have been if we did more of that 
I think we'd have those nodes on a, a global grid that uh, were particularly progressive. Well, uh, actually, I won't answer because uh, I'm here to ask, and I'm going to put the questions. Uh, many excellent questions and comments Can I coming take in one, uh, online. On, on, on this question, which is, how do you do it all together in pulling together uh, care delivery in public health, you know, and all this? Mm -hmm. um, I do think that the fundamental case needs to be made that health is central to everybody's well-being. You can ask anybody on the street and the government should understand that. But health also has a tremendous economic impact on the country, on society as well, witness COVID-19, right? And so if you think about this, it really required its fundamental change in outlook in terms of, well, you Department of Health, you are a budget and you are a drain on my budget versus this is required for all, all of government and of society approach to this. And in that regard, I think that um, if you look at the escalating cost of healthcare itself and the poor outcomes, there's plenty of reason to say we need to relook at this. And it's not only from the health perspective, from a societal perspective. So, um, Obviously, it's very difficult. How do you do this, right? And you would need the right government in place to do this. But Richard, I can tell you, I was just in Singapore. Mm. They have adopted all of Singapore through the Singapore government, through MOH, mm. called Healthier SG, where they're moving straight into population health. So as you know, they're already taking their country into three clusters with an academic health center in the middle, polyclinics. Now they're trying to pull in GPs as well, but the whole idea where Chichuan's going is to create a single budget for the cluster and look at outcomes. And they are also begin to integrate electronic health record, including GPs. I think in your country to succeed, you have to get GPs under the roof together with NHS to do this. And I think if you do an economic analysis, it'll be very easy because that's what the reason I think Singaporeans are doing this. They have good outcomes, so they realize the cost of care is going up. They're also seeing their NCDs going up. And so they're looking to change this altogether. So perhaps a model like this could help other countries to see what they can do. Just respond to that. Um, Malaysia is doing obviously a few steps behind Singapore, but our new health minister is driving a um, health reform that looks pivoting away from sick health to preventive and primary care. So I think there's no better time than now in terms of the past two and a half years experience, whether it's ministers of health or ministers of finance, to know that investment in health is investment in, in the economy and society. Yeah. And, and I think it it's up to all of us to keep reminding them that and, and really for the public as well as policymakers, um, the last two and a half years, I think would have got everyone to understand yeah. that, that health is, you know, without health, you, you're not going to have a thriving economy. Mm. Okay, let me feed in. Go on then. Yeah. Let's just, just wait for the microphone so everyone can hear you. Coming from the U.S., I think part of the issue has to be about reimbursement. And when you look at medical schools and you look at the somewhere around a $250,000 debt that an average medical student is going to have, that is going to influence what they choose as their specialty. It will not be primary care. It will not be obstetrics and gynecology. And it will not be um, psychiatry. So, and those are the three things that undermine a lot of the health and wellness of people within someone's country. So these choices are made based on reimbursement. And then when you go to um, you know, choose your specialty, whether it's you know, because of these reimbursements, that takes a very different toll 
on the health and well-being of, of your country in general. Plus, when you've got um, insurance companies who are making the determinations of the reimbursement, it, again, it's not towards public health well-being. It's a very different, you know, it's about your hospitals, it's about your bottom line, it's about your profitab profitability. So the things that a lot of you on this panel are looking to improve are not going to happen necessarily within a private sector, but that's where you need to have your government with regards to your um, um, health and social um, departments looking at this as a holistic kind of a situation, not as a disease, but as a holistic to look to say, we want to prevent this, but you're only going to prevent this with the right early intervention and getting everybody on the same track. Yeah. So, um, and in fact, the, the comment you've made there is similar to some comments or questions made online. There's somebody called Brent Lockridge and also Maria Innes Azambuja and Prof. Dr. Gutan Sen all effectively saying, how are we going to change doctors and what doctors do? Because, you know, if I think back to my uh, medical school education, uh, we did a tiny bit of what you're suggesting. They sent us, I was in Oxford, and they sent us to the Cowley Works for one day, a car factory, so you could see what life was like in the real world. That was one day. Um, <laughs> and it was, uh, it was tough. Um, well, I did spend some time in a plastics factory actually six months later on, but that's another story. But um, but the, the point they're making is that this, for, you know, it's basically not going to be a very sexy type of medicine, is it? You know, the kind of sexy medicine is is very academic, high flying, discovering molecules, going through to treatments. So how we change the mindset is is a question that several people are raising. But um, but as you say, in the UK we do have now the Department of Health and Social Care, so this should be the perfect place to, to to then try and drive these changes. And um, you, you've given, I think, our Prime Minister a hard time. Um, but of course, she uh, has said, I think, that she wants to take money from healthcare and put it into social care, uh, which of course many people uh, think is an abhorrent idea. But maybe Victor and, and everybody else, this is partly what you would all be endorsing as well. Uh, Tom, you say how, how you change the mindset, but... I'd say how often you change the mindset in the connected world is really important. We talked about the translational gap of years to get into practice, yet we face a crisis of antimicrobial resistance where the indications may change uh, at a moment's notice. We need to feed the latest information into practice by feeding the latest information into practice with the same rails. You start same paging different practitioners, you create more of a collective consciousness, you open up channels to do referrals differently. I, I don't think we have a, a, an approach to the transfer of knowledge that is timely enough or precise enough. So the other question is, who, who is going to do, even if you spend more time, uh, you know, Victor's, uh, the impression is that you want people to spend more time in the real world, um, working in difficult communities, et cetera. But do you think that will be enough? That, you know, the sort of implication is by osmosis, this will turn us all into empathetic doctors who understand some of these social issues. And I'm, I'm wondering actually whether you think, uh, you know, we should, we do medical school electives, we do time doing orthopedics, maybe we should spend three months as a social yeah. worker. And, and should we be taught by social workers? You know, where are we going to learn all these things? Those are fundamental questions. On the issue of uh, budget, I don't think it's a zero sum game. And it's what you need to do to increase social care the support and what you need for healthcare. Mm. And she may be right, at least the hypothesis is that if you have more social care, you need less healthcare, but you can't just do it overnight just like this. You're going to have to show that it's a hypothesis to be tested. Right? So as you know, and you talk about reimbursement, you know, I think you mentioned this value-based care, right? Certainly, I think that we've come a long way in our country through Obama and his ACA to start looking at value-based care and all of these uh, accountable care organizations which try to integrate, you know, uh, population, although that's loosely defined to specialty care under one payment, right? It's the right direction, long way to go. 
That's um, on reimbursement. I think in terms of changing mindset, um, perhaps we need to value public health practitioners and community health workers much better. And, and, and in this world now, it means paying them better compared mm -hmm. to um, you know, how we pay them for um, neurosurgeons, for instance. Yeah. We've got, we've got uh, some further questions in the audience. Hi, my name's Chloe. Um, I work in the policy um, team at the Institute of Cancer Research, but I'm also doing a master's in public health part time alongside work. Um, and my question kind of takes a, a bit of a different turn, but Dr. Zhao, in your presentation, you mentioned um, the importance of communication and gaining trust in the public. And I think throughout the pandemic, um, the, co the communication that our government put out should have been clear. It should have been you know, easy to follow. And I think it was kind of the opposite. <laughs> it was quite difficult to follow for sort of like the general public. So my question would be, if you had the opportunity to meet with the UK government for five minutes, um, what would you give, the advice would you give them on improving their communication about public health to the population? Uh, hi, I'm Professor Emily Levy at Imperial College London. So can I challenge you that none of this is the role of a doctor? Um, and that exactly as we've alluded to, there's, there's a finite amount we can learn at medical school. I know that a patient with asthma and COPD might be living in a damp house, breathing pollution or burning a wood fire in the back end of Pakistan. And I know those are the fundamental problems, but I may not be able to solve them. I might know who to phone or contact. And so this knowledge is out there. Um, and we also have a problem in all of our countries with not enough doctors. And if we're spending more time, we then also have to persuade the population that the thrombolytic service they want for stroke, which will take 25 doctors to help 40 patients in a small geography, is worthwhile doing. I just can't see how it's not even the how. It's, is this the right workforce to be doing what you're suggesting? Okay, that's a great, two, two great questions to... Uh begin to close the panel, please, Ian, and then we'll go to the third panel. They're great questions. And I think I would cast my mind broader on the workforce to the system that we have now than when I was training in the mid-80s. If I want to discharge a patient early now, and there's a virtual ward being run for early discharge, there's ambient sensing devices rolling out, there's large tele telecare deployments, there are new forms of communication. There are new relationships being built. So maybe not just going out and experiencing the social care worker, but the role of the social domiciliary care worker alongside that ambient sensing for the person recently discharged early from hospital is a complex communication problem. We increasingly deploy technologies that can spot a change in risk and send a notification to more than one member of a team at the same time, which provokes a conversation. So I don't think we should be bound by an old notion of that workforce, but certainly we have to preserve the excellence with scarce resources. Those connections can amplify that excellence, I believe. <laughs> Uh, you know, when I talk about academic medicine, I'm talking about what they teach their students and therefore the practitioners. Does not mean they need to walk away from what they do so well. But I think the awareness, understanding of public health issues, et cetera, is critically important. And then the system being put together for the practitioners, for the delivery, must include therefore public health. That's what I meant. Not to take away individual work. That being said, what I remember vividly when I was in training, I was told, don't worry about the money. Give the patient everything the best you can. And as I look back, I, that was not a good advice because I can write a prescription and the patient would not be able to afford this. So you're practicing anyway in the context of this where they live, asthma, right? I mean, we've seen patients who live in an older patient with asthma, 
live in a walker with full of dust and not able to be mobile. You have to take this in consideration and you are. All I'm saying is now let's take these other issues into further considerations. And furthermore, as a citizen, I want us to be better advocates for social change. Let's go beyond the day-to-day -day practice of medicine to being a citizen to say, the only thing you're gonna be able to make changes is to make those social changes necessary because that influences people's health. Yeah, and I think as with everything, it's gotta be about balance, isn't it? We um, just need to perhaps expand a little our um, responsibilities beyond just making sure that they, they're getting better, but be aware that they have those damp houses and all that. And this afternoon, we've been talking a lot about our role as clinicians and doctors, but don't forget, we have a whole team, um, social workers and, and physios, et cetera, et cetera, that I think also need to be, whose capacity um, also need to be built so that, you know, they can fill in the gaps that, that we as doctors don't have the, the time or the resource to do. So I think when Victor um, talks about academic medicine, I I believe you, you're you not just referring to, to doctors, but also to the whole team um, that needs to address all this. We'll just see Professor Van Berner, would you like to come in? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, thank you, very interesting questions and important ones. I'll start with, you know, what do we actually want the doctors to do? And I agree, we are really not saying doctors here, we are saying healthcare providers. And that healthcare provider is a vast range. Um, I come up. I come up from. I come from a country where we have, uh, you know, really shortage of all kinds of health workers. So much of what you said, you know, we could do this or that is really not applicable to our setting. But to our setting, what I really want is if the doctor, the clinical doctor, could simply start talking about prevention. Uh, for example, we. I live in one of the most polluted cities in the world, right? Uh, we are, as public health specialists, talking about how much it's costing us in terms of life and, and, and disabilities, and et cetera. But we really do not have clinical people standing next to us and saying, yes, it's important. They are the ones who are treating what's happening with people. So what I'm seeing here is in my setting, even if the clinical doctor starts to talk about the prevention, starts to talk with these patients as to how they really need to start thinking about how to how they can take care of themselves in this pollution, because people don't really seem to see it as pollution. So it's as simple as that. Um, it's not the doctors are meant to solve everything, but I think the doctors can, at least in our setting, start to facilitate that prevention and conversation with patients and government as to what's needed to be done to make that change at societal level. I also want to quickly comment on the mindset. Uh, we, I heard a lot about mindset of health providers. I think we also need to remember that we can't change mindset of everybody who gets into medicine. And we can't assume, we can't really think we need to do that. What we need is a system. That system facilitates the appropriate action irrespective of the mindset that you come in with. And that's something that we have to be very, we have to know because you really can't change someone, you can facilitate, you can adapt, and the system needs to make sure that irrespective of the mindset that you come with, you are still able to provide the care as it's needed. Thank you. It's conscious we haven't answered your question about COVID communication. We had, um, we had a very complex situation of mixed messages in COVID-19. Some landed very well, some didn't. I'm conscious that in my own city in Liverpool, in surveys, 76% of people trust local government, only 22% of people trust national government. So the answer was, use your local public health services. They know their communities and they're quite good at communicating with those communities. But we also have situations of misinformation that are very complex, are driven by bots online. We have very good technology. We have very good data science and defense to use one set of botnets to tackle another set of botnets, yet we don't have an agent-based approach to public health. There's a lot more can be done in the overlap of those um, information around health. Okay, Victor, yeah. and we'll go to Tom. Well, I was thinking about communication at several um, levels, if you will. First of all, our doctors should be, as scientists, should be better communicators. 
we're not. And so just like we taught how to do a physical exam, interview a patient, I think that should be part of learning. Doesn't have to take a lot of time in curriculum, mm -hmm. but part of learning how to communicate. I think that's key, right? And it's, you know, we need to be humble. We don't know the answer. We don't know the answer. And I think some of the problems is we give people what appears to be a fact that changes over time and therefore is not consistent. So I think you have to acknowledge this is what we know, this is what we don't know, and things may change. So that's one level. Second is I thought that there really should be an option to do communication science uh, in science and medicine, you know, like behavioral science. I mean, let's face it, you know, you may see people with entertainment as communicators, but really there's a science to communication. How do you get community to trust you, right? Mm -hmm. Just because you are a doctor, just because you are a famous artist. I think there's a lot of issues about how to gain their understanding of the, their challenges and to communicate properly. In fact, we did a whole report in the Academy about the communication during COVID on this kind of issue. And third, as you said, is who's a spokesperson for the government, right? You have to choose the right one who's, you know, if not a scientist, a physician, at least someone who's actually understanding of not only communication, but frequently advised by what to say, what not to be consistent. So there are multiple levels, but I'm just emphasizing how important it is now to think about communications and what we do. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Victor, on that. On the point of communication, my, my daughter is a medical student in Leeds, actually. She was telling me about the communication stuff she was taught, and she was horrified to learn that when I was a medical student, you weren't taught any communication at all. You, you just learned it by watching people doing it and thought to yourself, that looks good, I'll do that. And that looks terrible, I won't do that. But uh, So anyway, I, I was asked to, uh, in wrapping up, to try and say a few concluding remarks about what we've learned. Um, what I've learned is I would never have agreed to do that if I'd known what a challenging and all-encompassing <laughs> subject this was going to be. But I, I think we, I mean, we've had some fantastic talks and discussion. Thank you to those who contributed in all the different ways. Um, I, I, I'll have a go at summarizing. And I think in answer to the question, has traditional academic medicine had its day? The answer was no, but it needs to redefine itself. And it has to move on from being about individual patients and their individual diseases. However much some of us love just looking after our patients with our respiratory diseases. Um, it has to involve uh, communities, culture, environment, climate change, et cetera, et cetera. And there has to be convergence of many different disciplines. We heard from Adiba as a, as a dean asking questions about how we're going to achieve this. It's going to be very challenging for any medical school to encompass all this. And, and from uh, Raki, uh, Professor Dardona, about what the challenges might be in, in you know, I think your talk was very much focused on places like the US and the UK, but in countries like India, there's going to be whole different sets of challenges. Um, but it would seem some of these approaches are possible. Uh, Victor mentioned uh, the smoking free campaign in Liverpool as an example of uh, the health systems and the social care systems and the civic authorities coming together. And then, um, you know, uh, trying to imagine the, the, the medical student and the doctor of the future, Ian in himself has kind of demonstrated that it is possible to spend time doing clinical medicine and public health and uh, data science and all the other things you do. But uh, you are a bit of an oddity, if you don't mind me saying so. <laughs> there, there are not many people who manage to blend these things, but I guess in our medical students and doctors of the future, we will have to do more to, to produce more people who have these mixed skills so that we can redefine academic medicine.